Good evening, Alana. Thanks for being here. Hi, Harry. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, you're up on the West Coast somewhere, I believe, aren't you? Um, west, possibly, west, possibly. West of the Hudson River? I, I remain anonymous. I see. All right. Good. Well, you know, we've had some emails uh, back and forth about uh, your position, and I apparently have not, in my email announcement of this show, characterized you in the way that you think of yourself. So I think we should begin by you giving me a thumbnail description of your overview of this war on terrorism, what, what you think caused it and what you think ought to be done about it. Yes, Harry, I think we started um, our dispute this afternoon. Um, I guess that um, you characterize me as um, a proponent of the war on terror, and certainly if your listeners go to my website, um, they can read my pieces, and they're certainly very scathing of the sanctimonious and smug George Bush and his war. So um, I guess we might disagree on, on characterizing me. Well, go ahead and tell us, uh, <laughs> you, have, you have criticized the war on terror, but you do not criticize, you have not criticized this, I understand, at least from what I've read, you haven't criticized the bombing of Afghanistan, and, and I get the idea that you are in favor of a preemptive strike against Iraq. From what no, you've no, there, there you're wrong, I'm on record for saying definitely not. Um, so certainly that's, that's a misstatement. I'm on record saying um, quite a few times that I'm against any attack on, on Iraq. I don't think that the Bush administration has provided any evidence um, that would satisfy my, my um, criteria that uh, Saddam Hussein is involved in any way. Well, um, so certainly that, that's not true, but maybe we should um, uh, proceed from discussing our main um, dispute, which is about pacifism. Um, the more I read of your pieces, the more I do get the feeling that for you, violence in any form is a bad thing. Um, and to my mind, um, there is some, something of a permutation of pacifism, the belief that violence is always unproductive. Um, it's certainly a very progressive leftist view. Um, for instance, you say things like Sharon promises to punish terrorists, yet he fails to influence them. And first and foremost, I take from that um, a utilitarian statement. And why do I say that? Because the premise that you use is that unless punishment generates the best outcome for all, it's not a good thing. Um, certainly, in my view, proportional punishment um, against an aggressor is part of justice. And can justice be violent? Sure, of course it can, especially if it's a response to violence. So the idea that um, justified aggression always fails is, to my mind, not only pacifism, but it's one of those, um, how should I put it, unthinking commonplaces of the New Age times we live in. So... Not to punish wrongdoing inverts the moral order. That's what I would say. And frankly, I can't think of anything more dangerous than living in a world where um, the moral order is topsy-turvy, uh, as progressives have done to us. Well, I have advocated right from the beginning that the people who perpetrated the World Trade Center bombing should be uh, sought out, if possible, captured, and if captured, then taken to trial, and if proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, according to our standards of justice and the uh, English, uh, Anglo-Saxon, American common law rules of evidence, then they should be punished. But you do not punish uh, Osama bin Laden if it turns out that he's the guy behind all this. You do not punish him by bombing Afghanistan. You don't punish him by just simply going over there and killing a lot of people. And this is what I have objected to from the beginning. I am not a pacifist. I am certainly a nonviolent individual. But that doesn't mean I do not believe in the right of self-defense. The difference is that if somebody hits me, and I hit him back, that's self-defense. But if somebody hits me and I hit his sister, that's not self-defense. That's aggression, pure and simple. And I have tried to make this distinction from the beginning that to just simply go over there and take revenge and to bomb people and try to make us feel good when government never achieves the ends that it says it's going to do. It always goes over there to rid the world of evildoers, to, to uphold human rights, to, to get rid of the tyrants and so on. And we wind up with something usually as bad or worse after it's all over with. I just don't see it at all. And I don't think that's pacifism. Well, um, I guess after 9-11, there were two kinds of reactions from libertarians, as far as I can discern. One was yours, and that was, um, woe is me, it's entirely the American fault. This is what happens when we irritate the peace-loving Muslims. Uh, violence breeds violence. Let's remember the feds are, are worse than the terrorists. And my response, I think, was somewhat more realistic. I just said that um, I refused on any terms to exculpate um, the actions of these people. Um, and I conceded. And I think this is where you don't um, bring in reality testing, Harry. I conceded that since the state monopolizes defense, and since none of us is able to orchestrate an attack against al-Qaeda, and since someone has to do it, and so on and so forth, um, you know, let's deal with reality. I, to my mind, Harry, and I think this is really where we differ, I think there's more veracity in addressing reality than in sitting on the fence and indulging in ideological cant. Of course, I'm, a, I'm probably, I'm told I'm an anarchist, but I don't live in a private property, uh, a knockout capitalistic society. I have to address, address the contingencies. So the other issue I would bring up, and that uh, perhaps stems from a column you wrote, um, I think you called it the Welcome to the War on Terrorism, was it, Comrade? Yes. And there you almost, um, Harry, taunt your reader for supporting the excursion into Afghanistan, um, 
And you almost frame the notion that getting the perpetrators has no moral legitimacy. That's the feeling, or at least the tone of the, the column. And then you go on to conflate such a support um, with the support for nationalizing the airports or sundering the Bill of Rights. Um, your theory seems to be that someone who supports an incursion into Afghanistan must somehow support all government ills. And I think that's too messy, and that's a reductio I can't possibly see. Um, Libertarians are very clever, but I do think they get confused. The anarchists think that because the state has no legitimacy, that everything the state does is illegitimate. And to my mind, there's a logical confusion there. If, well, you, if you can get what I'm saying. Well, <laughs> you've covered a great deal of ground. You've uh, made a number of points, and I should have been making more notes than I did because I, it would be very difficult to go back now to uh, something you said towards the beginning that uh, and actually quote you correctly. I would probably mischaracterize it as much as I believe that you are mischaracterizing me. Oh, for, for, for example, when you say, let's remember the feds are worse than the terrorists, um, I've never said that. I've never no, said no, anything I, I was, like that. Sorry, Harry, I was saying that these were the general um, comments that came from the materials on your camp. Well, uh, you said there were two schools of thought on this. I think that there are many schools of thought, and I think that there can be many unrealistic uh, attitudes, uh, for it, which seems to concern you. You want to face reality. Well, the reality is that as much as we would wish that the government is going to make everything all right and that this is a legitimate function of government and that the Constitution asks for the government to do it and on and on and on and on, we know full well from experience that when all this is over with, we're not going to rid the world of terrorists. And what we're going to have is, like we had after the Second World War, a tyranny even worse than the one that we went out there and killed all those people and had all those Americans killed to try to get rid of. After the Korean War, a stalemate. After Vietnam, the communists took over anyway. Uh, Alana, uh, is there anything you'd like to say in response to what I said before the break? Thanks, Harry. First, I would really like you to ask your listeners to uh, join me every Wednesday on worldnetdaily.com for my column. And please to, um, you know, peruse my website at elanamersa.com and especially read my article called Facing the Onslaught of Jihad, where I do really expound on my views. Um, but, yes, I would like to get back to your notion of serving a subpoena to Mr. Bin Laden and, um, uh, you know, what I think about the practicality or the justice base to that. Um, Harry, you have to admit that there's a good base or a good case for shooting a terrorist on site if you know that person is a terrorist. Um, would it not have been better had the Israeli security guard at LAX shot the murderer before he drew his weapons. Um, so, in my opinion, it's correct to say that by adopting the credo of jihad, certain people have forfeited their right to life. They have no, they've alienated their right to life. I see. And but, but, who, yeah, but who is the judge and no, jury no, and executioner? I the... But there we agree. But at what stage do their rights fall away? There you and I agree. I'm not sure. The problem lies in the details. Um, I know that I agree with you that uh, Padilla should have a trial in the full light of day, and that... Um, the individual that the government has arrested ought to be charged if they are citizens, deported if they are illegals, the many thousands of people that have been arrested. But certainly I have no problem saying that Osama bin Laden should be shot on sight. The credo of jihad that he has purported to, uh, I mean, he hasn't even purported to, he has adopted and has conspired to murder people makes him, uh, you know, in, not, not having the right to life. He has forfeited his right to life. Well, that's well and good. Uh, can you name any other people? And I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but can you name any other people you uh, have on the most wanted list? Any other individuals? Oh, oh Harry, you're very, you're very sweet trying to marginalize me, but certainly I don't think I'm marginalized by saying that Osama bin Laden should be shot on sight. Well, what, I, what I'm getting at is that, uh, according to the news reports, there are over 4,000 people who died in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. Afghan people. And I kind of doubt that all those people had forfeited their right to life especially the ones at the wedding a few weeks ago, and a lot of others also. And all we know is that George Bush has uh, incontrovertible evidence that Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda is behind this, and the Afghan, uh, a lot of Afghan people are shielding them, and, you know, and on and on and on. No, no, I think you're conflating issues. We both agree that those mistakes are, are even though they are not um, done with intention, as Osama bin Laden's uh, murders are done with intention, with intent. Part of it, the law says that intent is what is very important in, in, the, in the determination of culpability. Surely well, then, I mean, if, if I give my car keys to a drunk in a bar, and he goes out and kills somebody, uh, with my car, and I say, well, I never intended for him to kill anybody. I just wanted him to get home. Uh, am I now innocent? Am I, and whether or not I'm innocent according to this strict letter of the laws of the land as they exist today, am I really innocent of wrongdoing in the, in the case? I don't believe so because I should have known better than to hand a weapon to, uh, which oh, is no, a car. No, 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 no. no it's, what you're saying is like saying that, that the, the person who manufactures the bed upon which a rape occurs is culpable. No, I think we're straying, no. we, we're straying too far from, from the nitty-gritty of the argument. 
when well, it comes to Osama bin Laden. I think you have to be a, a nutty conspiracy theorist to say that there is no evidence that Osama bin Laden and his many videos and his uh, phalanxes of, of um, followers are not plotting jihad, plotting murder. Well, we, can, we could discuss that, but I don't know that there's any profit in doing so. Let's just assume that we all know and we are all absolutely sure that Osama bin Laden is guilty. That does not justify, in my view, the killing of other people. Secondly, it does not justify handing the gun to make the killing to Fearless Fosdick, who, for younger listeners don't know, was the old Bill Abner character who was a police detective who went around trying to kill criminals and kept killing innocent people in the process. I didn't understand your last point, Eric. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I well, didn't make it very clear. Uh, the point is that just because we think that Osama bin Laden uh, should be captured, killed, whatever it is you want to see happen to him, doesn't mean that we hand the gun to a lot of people who have been known for going out and killing innocent people in the Sudan, in Iraq, in various places around the world. And we know that they're going to go out and kill a lot of innocent people. And they're going to tell you they didn't mean to. And they're going to tell you that this was a miscalculation. And on and on and on. Well, well but, it, 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 it amazes me, Harry. I'm surprised that um, I just wanted to comment that, you know, for my column, which is entitled Return to Reason, I'm very fond of pointing out logical confusions. And um, I think equating the state, the military, uh, you know, an ism, an entity with individual soldiers on the ground is a confusion. And I noticed that you're very eager to impute consistent and wholesale evil to American soldiers. No. And, I don't, and, just, just wait, and I don't mean the men and women of the military. I only mean the men because I don't consider the women legitimate participants. But you are reluctant to indict Osama on, on the wealth of evidence that we have. So just once again, I want to clarify that I really think that um, I agree with you. The state as an entity has no legitimacy. But that does not mean that everything the state does is illegitimate. It's a logical confusion. And I ask you to imagine a murderer on the run from the police. Okay, I also use an analogy. Um, he might be running through a slum, and he knows that his hours are numbered. He's going to be shot down or something. So he leaves his worldly, worldly goods to, let's say, a poor child in the slum or an animal sanctuary. Is the deed wrong because he's a murderer? Similarly, um, take the rapist that got caught in California for killing and raping the little baby, the five-year-old. He will probably suffer death at the hands of the state. You won't find me protesting. Well, that's fine, uh, but we we have the problem that, uh, well, I, I don't want to get into defending my views because you're here to present your views, and I do not attribute evil to the soldiers on the ground. The soldiers on the ground do not make the decisions as to who's going to get bombed and so on. It's, that's all made at the highest levels. It may not, the individual sorties may not be decided at the highest levels, mm -hmm. but it's decided by people uh, appointed by George W. Bush, just like the people who were appointed by Franklin Roosevelt, waged World War II in many cases, many instances, for political reasons, not mm -hmm. just the war itself, but the way they waged the war. Uh, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, it goes on and on and on. And to attribute to these people the ability to do what they say they're going to do and promise what they're going to do is, to me, unrealistic. But I want to get off of this um, comparing your views with mine. As mm -hmm. Paul says, I'm not getting a sense of exactly what she does think should be done about the war on terrorism. Could she just put that forward in a standalone way instead of framing it in response to what she thinks Harry's beliefs are? Mm -hmm. I think it would be more interesting and it might move things forward faster. Yeah, yeah. Could you give us a summary of what it is you think the U.S. government should do and shouldn't do? Well, it certainly should uh, recall its troops from Afghanistan. We're on the same page there. and it certainly should, should the troops never have been there? I, I believe, and as I've said in, in, in uh, numerous um, articles, that a um, surgical uh, operation, whether it's mercenaries, whether it's private armies, things that you and I know that will, will never transpire, is to eliminate the jihadists is very legitimate. Let me give you an example. Um, and once again, I ask you not con to confuse uh, my endorsement of um, something done by the state as a legitimization of the state. After the World War II, um, many Nazis um, started pitching up all over Europe, drowned in a pool of, um, you know, in a puddle. This was a result of a policy by the Israeli government to take out the specific criminals. They did not launch war. They did not hurt innocents. And they had certain rules that decreed that unless you were almost 100% sure, as much as they could, you were not to proceed against the target. That kind of precision targeting, I certainly think, would, would, would um, be something I would support. Because certainly, Harry, you, with all your um, good intentions, is not going to, are not going to defend me against a smart bomb, are you? I'm not going to defend against the smart... You mean me personally? You are not capable of because you uh, have not got the... Um, because the state monopolizes defense. So we have to address reality here. So certainly as I've Fine, said... Fine, but, but maybe if we realize that the state is going to do a horrible job of, uh, in it, we need to look for other approaches. And to me, the most important approach 
is not to be nice to terrorists, as you have accused me of doing, not to coddle people, not to try to influence those terrorists, but to quit harming innocent people around the world. And I'm not just talking about the last nine months. I'm talking about the last 50 years of occupying uh, 100 countries around the world, of giving foreign aid to dictators, of giving military might to put down revolutions, of doing all these things, of starving the people in Iraq and so forth. And and terrorists will always be with us. Brutes and uh, tyrants will always be with us, but they don't get popular support until they act on real grievances. Then they get the money then they get the connections, then they get the networking to make it possible to bomb the World Trade Center and to do acts like that that become real dangers to us. Well, Harry, we agree on, on foreign policy. I'm with you on that. However, um, I believe that you're misguided as to the cause of Islamic terrorism. I think it's a bit of libertarian naivete, frankly. Um, and you seem to apply the same script to every event in history. Um, your World War World, uh, One revisionism, I'm no historian, but blaming American intervention for the rise of Hitler and Stalin, um, sound citations is a little odd to me. Uh, you know, just framing these assertions as truth doesn't make them so. Uh, you know, no, as a matter of fact, I don't just frame them. I give the reasons for it, and I explain what was going on at the time the U.S. entered the war and so on. I am not dealing in one-line slogans. I'm trying to explain the dangers of American foreign policy when Americans believe that somehow some act of the government, by virtue of what the president has said, is going to go over and make everything well, all right in Europe or Afghanistan or Iraq or Israel or someplace are, else when it never does. It usually leads to something even worse than what existed before. Harry, I object only to your post hoc um, causality. In other words... You look at an event and then you say, ah, it's imperialism, ah, it's American foreign policy, uh, foreign policy. I agree with you on your prescriptions for American isolationism. We are on one page on that. Well, then why, then why, do, you, okay. why do you say that I'm, I'm uh, tossing off one-liners about the First World War and so on when I'm trying to explain to people what, well, the dangers that occur when, when Americans get involved where they shouldn't? No, I said, again, I said blaming American intervention for the rise of Hitler and Stalin is odd. I don't... I don't see how you arrive at such, as, uh, you know, you make such assertions and make them sick. But let's get to the present. Um, here's the thing. Muslims are killing Jews in Israel. They did that. They killed Jews well before the American, uh, the U.S. was, was a factor. They killed them in, in um, Arab countries throughout the centuries. They're killing Hindus in India. They're killing Kurds in Iraq. The state of Lebanon, which had a constitution that was devised to protect Christian minority, um, has been sealed. Lebanon is now occupied by Muslims. I'm not going to mention what Muslims are doing in Sudan, the Philippines. If you saw the news today, Saudi Arabia, the, the debate there is between the people on the ground who support al-Qaeda and the regime that is a tad less extreme. Many other scholars have pointed out the fact that the Muslim world is more extreme than its leaders. Arafat will be usurped not because he's a terrorist, but because he isn't enough of one. So I think your formulations about causality are naive. That's no, all don't, let's not talk about me. What is it you want to see happen? What do you want the government to do? Haven't I just said, said what I would like? No, no, you just said call, that, that there's a lot of, that there's hundreds of millions of Muslims around the world who are fanatics. And uh, what I want to know is what you want to do about it. Do you want to go kill them all? Absolutely not. But we well, have what is it you want to do then? But you must understand that the attack against Americans is not um, solely a result of these scripts that you apply. All but right, let's, let's, let's grant that for the moment. You what is it you want to do? I mean... What okay, is it? Forget me, about forget about me. What is it you want to see happen? Sure, let me say. You're not me. in favor of the war on ter terrorism. You're not in favor of what George Bush is doing. You're not in favor of what I have suggested. What is it that you want to see happen? I would ideally like to see uh, the kind of uh, private armies, uh, you know, contractors go out and eliminate like Pac-Man, like Pac-Man of the universe, eliminate these people. I would certainly like to see a, uh, uh, um, you know, a uh, lack of em emphasis on multiculturalism, pluralism, and diversity in America that uh, simply, you know, sunders our worldview and undermines our Western worldview. It, jihad, where it's preached in America, must stop. How? And, and By... immigration must become, we do have the means to defend ourselves through defense rather than offense. Immigration must become culturally compatible, Harry. And uh, we, must not, we must not cultivate a fifth column in the USA. The American people do not deserve to be endangered by a government that wants to let in a third world contingent in order to support its power base. That's my position. So I would bring it back to... Um, Rather than offense, defense. All and right, so if, if now let, I don't want to mischaracterize you, and I know you're not saying that multiculturalism caused the World Trade Center bombing. Oh, Harry, quit that. That's not fair. Well, but that's what, you've been, that's what you've been saying about me. But what, what I want to know then is that if we stop immigration, keep all the, the, the Arabs out, the, the Muslims, the, the, what, the people you think are probably extremists and so forth, and that will make terrorism, uh, that will make us safe from terrorism, I, I want to know what it is you but want to do. Said, certainly that is something that the government should be, uh, you know, protecting its citizens is certainly within the purview of a classical liberal right, I'm not arguing about I'm not arguing about whether the government can do it or not, but do you think that that, that immigration, a better immigration policy, better by your standards, is going to solve the problems of terrorism? Certainly. Don't you think so? Many people think so. 
Pat Buchanan, uh, Peter Brimler, a well-researched uh, uh, person on immigration. Um, many people concur that the real war is at home. And I think your, your listeners can read a column with that title on my webpage. Um, George Borges, another Harvard academic, certainly. All right. Now, who are you going to entrust to make sure that we don't just stop everybody from coming in, but we stop the wrong people from coming in? Oh, well, there, there you and I have the same problem. We can try and work on it together. Uh, I'm sorry, but I decline. I'm not, not interested in trying to make government work. It that's, doesn't that, work. No, that's not fair, Harry. That's not what I'm trying to do either. What I'm is it you're trying to do? I'm trying to address reality. I really resent that reframing of my uh, libertarian principles. I think, I think, Go ahead. I, I think to, um, to many libertarians are not anarchists. Many libertarians are founding father libertarians, are classical liberals, and they will certainly agree that protecting people from a foreign invasion in terms of immigration is very legitimate. Everybody wants to be protected. Nobody's arguing but, but that Harry, we shouldn't keep, be protected. I say protecting from foreign, um, or what Murray Rothbard called swamping of local populations by foreigners, and you say protected. You keep jumping levels of discourse. Well, no, you just said that some libertarians believe that the government ought to protect them, and I'm saying that everybody thinks that they want to be protected. Uh, we're going now to Austin, Texas, and talk with Terry, and I'm sorry, Terry, that you had to wait on the phone so long while I monopolized the conversation. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, the waiting is not a problem, and I'm glad to hear that your next hour is not going to be merciless. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Uh, all right, so as I've been listening, I've, of course, uh, mutated uh, and changed some of the questions that I was, or the questions <laughs> I wanted to because uh, actually you addressed some of it. I I'll only say one thing, which I think you probably would both agree on, is that the, the current uh, administration, probably all the government administrations that are likely to get in, have not been very credible. Uh, they, they did swear to uphold the Constitution. The Constitution does have a process to deal with things like the response to 9-11, uh, and uh, they completely uh, bypassed that process, ignored it, and in so doing, in violation of what they swore to uphold. Give us an example, Terry. Oh, mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, committed acts of war without going to the uh, Congress to ask for uh, Congress to take the issues out in the open and either declare war or issues, issue letters of mark and reprisal. When uh, the United States was attacked at, uh, at Pearl Harbor, uh, within three days, Congress came back uh, on an emergency procedure to declare war. Whether you agree with the decision or not, at least they abided by their own Constitution. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the fact that uh, the Bush administration had chose to ignore that which it swore to uphold uh, means that whatever they do, is not credible. Whatever they have to say about Bin Laden, I don't know. What, I don't know about Bin Laden because the information is coming from a not credible source. Uh, but I, in listening to what you were saying about immigration, um, immigration and terrorism, uh, most of the Muslims are Asian. Uh, is the terrorism uh, somehow genetically hard coded into the specific races? If not, if it's a matter of ideas and such, well, ideas are flowing through uh, the telephone that we're talking on now, the internet that I'm listening to the Harry Brown show uh, over. Uh, Common, ordinary people with ordinary desktop computers are now able to take things that were uh, video and audio on television and for free. It's free these days to get software to turn it into audio and video that you can then transmit over the, over the Internet. So uh, simply stopping the bodies, if you could figure out which DNA, which DNA codes were the ones that you wanted to stop, and I'm not sure that would have done anything for the Tim, Tim McVay brand of uh, terrorism. I mean, if you're, if, if you're really going to deal with the terrorism ideas, well, what are you going to do? Uh, stop the... Uh, Stop the new technologies. Do uh, you think that's even an option? Just before the break, mm -hmm. uh, Terry from Austin, Texas called in, and if I may oversimplify his statement, and I may not, but I'm going to anyway, if we stop, if stopping immigration will do it, uh, we would still, unfortunately, have all these ideas permeating via the Internet and email and telephones, faxes, and all the other wonders of modern technology. Uh, do you have anything to say in response to that? Sure. I just want to encourage your listeners to go to my website. If they like my accent, they might even like my picture. So that's a little plug. But, um, yes, post 9-11, I think that uh, many Americans may be wishing that uh, the country didn't harbor, as I said, a fifth column of legitimate immigrants, uh, rooting perhaps even actively working for the demise of the U.S. Harry, we are libertarians. Ideas don't frighten us. Ideas over the Internet, you know, we can combat with argument, but we, it's a little more difficult to combat active um, agitators and bombs and suicide bombers, etc. So um, I would say to, to your previous caller that um, the immigration quagmire is, is certainly um, not reducible to, you know, calculus of our immigrants are viable thing economically, but I would say along the lines Peter Brumlow um, elaborates in his book is that there is a need for some degree of ethnic and cultural coherence um, in order to actually safeguard the free market and freedom itself. Um, 
But we don't have any cultural coherence in America. Well, we, we've lost it, and this is precisely... Um, no, we, lo- we lost it not because of immigrants. We have lost it well, because the whole idea of what America was has long since been abandoned. Uh, that, that, too, I agree with you. But certainly there was a marked uh, difference beginning with 1965, the amendments to the Immigration and Nationality Act, when national origin restrictions were repealed. And... Our immigration now is predominantly third world, from the third world. It is culturally incompatible. And um, from Canada and Israel? No, no, predominantly it comes from the third world. But we also but, have immigrants from Canada and Israel, but you wouldn't keep them out? No, I would not keep Western immigration out. That's far more compatible with the idea of freedom and free market. Okay. Look, I'd, look I'd, Harry, Harry, I'm not an apologist for multicultural. You won't find me doing the leftist thing of every, every culture is equal. I'm not a cultural relativist. 85% of... Um, the 16 million legal uh, immigrants that arrived in the U.S. between 68 and 93 were from the third world, and that's very scary, um, you know. And the other thing I would point out to your your um, your previous call is that certainly um, immigrant populations acculturate to the politics of petulance that we perpetuate, namely identity politics. And you will find that many people come from countries that are not free in the least, but they get to here to this country and they become um, militant in their distinctiveness. Um, and certainly going back to the pre-65 immigration policies might be a great help. But the people who bombed the World Trade Center were not immigrants. They were just here on student visas and mm-hmm. other things mm-hmm. of that sort. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you would end all of that also? The student visas. Yeah. I would, I've certainly am on record for calling for um, racial profiling and so on. Okay. Well, we got that straight. Let's go to Indianapolis and talk with Guy. Guy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here, Harry. Oh, good evening, Guy. Sorry you had to wait so long. That's okay. Hey. I'm uh, saying I'm sorry we missed you last week uh, when we ran out of time, so we're glad that you called in earlier tonight. Well, I have a, a plethora of, of topics, and since you have Mrs. Mercer with us, I'd like to comment that uh, her stance on immigration is, is a little bit shallow. Um, people don't come to this country to change the United States into an anti-capitalist country. They don't come here to... to uh, teach their terrorism to other people. They come here for a better place to live. Oh, you, you know that for a fact, do you? Excuse me? You know that for a fact? I know that for a fact, yes. Oh, yes. Well, why, would, why would you bother exploiting your terrorism in a country that detests terrorism? Why not do it in another country, in a country like uh, Libya or you know, Iraq or Iran? Why, why would you come to the United States, a, a country who, after one incident, fanatically becomes anti-terrorist? Why would you do that? The only reason you would come to the United States, if it's by a student or by a person who wants to get ahead in business, why would you do that? Well, uh, you probably have a very tough time explaining then why um, terrorism notwithstanding, why immigration policies have accounted for the fact that we have um, a very different population from what we had prior to 65. We have populations that are far more likely to be welfare dependent, far more likely to live in um, segregated communities to be, um, which are subject to radicalization, as I pointed out before that. You might have a problem explaining that. Well, uh, I, not, I, wouldn't not, have, I wouldn't have any problem explaining it. Not uh, notwithstanding. I, I can explain it, Harry. I'm sure you can back me up. As a libertarian, I don't dist- detest immigration. I don't have any problem with immigration. I have a problem well, with the welfare state. If you don't offer these things, they don't take them. Yes, There's when you said they only have the only the only chance they have to get ahead in the United States is to compete in the free market. Well, if they don't have that. If, I mean, if if they don't have the motive to come here and compete with other people. They have no reason to come here. It, they would you know, be wasting their time by know, trying to change our system. Why don't you avoid stating that your perspective is the only libertarian perspective of legitimacy, sir? Um, since you've accused me of, of shallowness, certainly you should not uh, um, deny the fact that you are avoiding reality. You have to address the fact that we are letting in people that are far more likely to be welfare dependent and to siphon and to live off our monies. Well, if, uh, I, if, uh, I call it, if I had called into a, Rush Limbaugh, you would have a point, but we are in a libertarian. You know, I don't, uh, Harry. Libertarian issues. Harry, I thought libertarian you were going to uh, adjudicate these, uh, these, these. Incidents. Well, I've been trying to get a word know, in edgewise without. Let me just success. let me just preface by saying that Murray Rothbard, I don't think he would dispute his libertarian credentials with anti-immigration. So is um, Hans Hopper, professor at Nevada University. Yeah, and, we, we and don't the, need to argue about. And the raison what, debt for that is the swamping by the central state of existing populations for political ends. That's what, it. We don't need to argue about what is the libertarian position because we all agree that libertarians. Uh, are going to differ on one point or another and extend uh, uh, principles out to different conclusions. Mm -hmm. But we also need to recognize that just because more people are on welfare now and there are more immigrants than there were in 1965 doesn't mean that the immigrants have caused that. It may be that we have far more liberal welfare laws now than we did in 1965. And uh, and any other contention that you're making also has alternative explanations from just simply thinking that all of this is the result of immigration. I think that Guy's point is a good one. Why would people come here to change the United States? Uh, what, what's the, the motive for people to come here? It's like the argument that the Mexicans are 
moving to the United States so that they can uh, recapture California and Texas and all of these uh, states and make them part of Mexico again. It, it makes no sense whatsoever. Why is anybody going to give his life to a cause like that when what he really wants to do is to better look, his own life? Look, let, let's get the, the argument here clear. You are trying to make an argument for open immigration policies, and you are conflating it with an argument uh, accusing me of conflating open immigration with terrorism, which I have not done. You asked me how we might help reduce... Um, and you said that it was possible, possible creations of fifth columns within our midst, and I said to you very clearly that we could encourage, as was pre-1965, immigration that was culturally compatible. And well, invited immigration, not welfare immigration, invited immigration. I'm an immigrant to the U.S. Um, of A, uh, as of April, and I'm an invited immigrant, as would happen in a private property anarchy, Harry. I am invited here by another property owner in order to work more specifically my husband is because he has the necessary skills. There is no way we could ever be welfare dependent. Well, that's fine. So what you're saying then is we have to weed out all these people who have been coming here from India and Pakistan and these other places and filling no, jobs in the computer industry? Not at all, but why distort what I say? I really well, you're, you're trying to make it a cultural thing that we have no, to I, keep I people from certain cultures. Not at all. I qualified it. I said invited immigration with an emphasis on a preference for cultural compatibility. Invited immigration includes people that are invited by other business owners to uh, fill skilled positions. We'll try to... Uh, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll elaborate when I get back. We'll try to get a hold of Mark in San Leandro, whom we couldn't make a connection with a little while ago. And I was going to move to Chicago and look for a job there, but I won't now because nobody in Chicago has invited me. We'll be right back. Um, well, you know, you were just purporting to be a high priest of libertarianism on immigration. I just wanted to give your listeners some startling uh, statistics, at least as I remember them roughly from a, from a column I wrote. In 1999, there were over 600,000 legal uh, immigrants. Only 55 had been invited as skilled immigrants by other employees, by other employers, excuse me. So the rest were relatives, um, refugees, people with unspecified ties in the U.S., as well as beneficiaries of diversity programs. On top of that, you have about 1.3 million um, illegals. And if there's anything libertarians can agree on, is that a constitutional government has an obligation to repel foreign invaders. That's, well, all, I, that's if, all I have to say. All right. Uh, you consider them foreign invaders. I don't, but I, I don't see any point in going down that road now. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Mark in San Leandro. Good evening, uh, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you hear us? Yeah, finally. Okay. I cut off. But, uh, we I had a problem with one line. I'm sorry, yeah. Mark. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm sorry okay, to have to rush I had you. A question. I had a question for Alana. Alana? Hi. Yes. hi. Yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, you talk about a lot about foreign invaders and everything, but I consider immigrants my friends. I consider these people to be people who want to come to this country to better themselves. There, there's no one culture in this country. There never has been. It's, right now it's 280 million cultures. And you have no right, no God-given natural right, to force your particular culture on everyone through the government. You just don't have that right. Not and through I, the government. Not through yeah, the government. You believe in keeping out immigrants which you claim are not supporting your culture, and you don't have that right. Well, I think you forget your founding father's culture, my dear. You forget that, you know, uh, like many modern Americans, you forget um, you are so taken with a multicultural uh, diversity creed, which is state-created, and it actually... It is not state-created. It is, state it, enforces it, but it, it didn't create it. Well, it is used to, to enforce state... I don't believe in the state enforcing a multicultural creed any more than I believe in the state enforcing a Western pro-Israel or pro-anything else. No, let's not, let's not go to pro-Israel. Okay, but I'm, just, I'm just saying, you have no right to enforce your, your view of culture on people any more than the, than the leftists do, any more than the conservatives do. Or you, you or no right I do. I'm not enforcing my views. I've been asked for my views. They've been elicited. I've been given, I've given know, them voluntarily. You believe, you believe in using the government to force your particular view of what culture should be in this country? Not at all. Not but at all. Y yes, Alana, so I have to agree with him. No, but you're you're saying that the force of government should be used to keep out the people who, who you believe will infect the culture that you I believe in. I think there's a, there's a vast difference of saying that I'm enforcing culture on people Whereas you people are forgetting that this, has, this was a Western culture. It is very easy to forget that every single freedom we have stems from the West, not from the East, or the Near East for that matter. And I think I would like you to read Mises in the anti-capitalist mentality, and he harps very nicely on the contribution of the East and the Near East to freedom. So I am not an apologist at all for my own culture, for Western culture, and I certainly believe that uh, the, the West uh, we can credit with, with the greatness in this country. I'm not an apologist for my culture either, my Western culture, but I don't believe in forcing it on everyone. And I just can't, as a libertarian, you cannot justify... And I do, not, I do not believe in forcing it. All you ask me is how one can prevent um, terrorism, and I said to you, by simply encouraging pre-1965 immigration policies. Which, which, which I took by, I don't think even by extension, but by your very words, that meant that we should be keeping out of this country the people whose culture is not compatible with ours, in your view. You know, we're back to the racial um, profiling argument. And I, I'm, we, not we, making, I'm not no, making no, no. up racial profiling. We, yeah. we, yes, we, it's the same logical argument, Harry. What are the chances that um, a white Danish female, age 20, is a terrorist? We're back to the same illogical Silliness that, More that terrorists immigrate from Canada than Mexico, so I think we should... But, 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 those, but those are, those are uh, Islamists. 
So let's, let's not fudge things. So if you want to start on the racial profiling, that is all I'm translating in, into immigration terms. That is all. The likelihood that culturally compatible immigration will... Okay, I'm sorry we're going to have to wind it up because uh, we're going to have to go to the break, and I don't want to keep Alana any further. She's been gracious enough to stay over for an extra half hour. And I appreciate your views. I do not agree with a lot of what you've said, though, but, of course, we didn't cover all the things that we do agree on, and I appreciate the fact that you're trying to spread libertarianism out there at World Net Daily. Thanks, Thanks so much Harry. for being here. Thanks for having me, Harry. Uh, before we go back to the phones, I would like to just go through some of these emails that came in during the last hour and a half. I do not like to encourage you to call or to email me and then uh, seem to be ignoring them. So I do want to cover these quickly. And because Alana is not here to answer them, I am not going to make extended comments on them either. Ben says, uh, Miss Mercer passes the reality check. Unfortunately, you don't, meaning me, Harry. The current jihad has little to do with American foreign policy, but it is rather Islam doing its traditional thing, convert or die. Well, Ben, I hope you'll email me again and tell me what the solution is then. Do we just go kill every Muslim in the world we can find in order to stop this convert-or-die jihad? If not, what is the solution? Larry says, what are Ms. Mercer's thoughts on the cause of the Muslim aggression? If we do as she suggests and surgically kill Osama bin Laden, we are treating the symptom but ignoring the cause. Cut him down and two will spring up in his place. Nothing we can do will guarantee the safety of Americans. But I'd like to know how she proposes to prevent these attacks in the future. Well, as near as I can tell, it all hinges on changing our immigration policy. But I do not want to put words in her mouth. David writes to say, Ilana said she thought it was naive to attribute Islamic terrorist attacks against the U.S. to foreign interventionism. However, ever since Middle East terrorism as we know it today began in the 1970s, the terrorists have always cited specific goals, whether it was to release hostages or protest U.S. support of the terrorist enemies. 9-11 is no exception. Bin Laden cited the presence of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia, uh, near Mecca, as well as in the millions in aid we've given to support Israel in its war against the Palestinians. Why should we not believe him? I would also refer Alana to a 1997 report by the Defense Science Board, which says that historical data show a strong correlation between U.S. involvement in international situations and an increase in terrorist attacks against the United States. The theory is eminently reasonable and supported by reality. There is a... Well, I'm sorry, I thought there was a website here. It's not. It's just a report, and so I won't put that on the website because the chances of your being able to get it would be very remote. That's the Defense Science Board report. But apparently it is a division of the U.S. Department of Defense that published it in October 1997. Uh, Jared says, please ask her why are the civilians of Afghanistan less innocent or their lives less valuable than the victims of the September 11th attack? Why is it moral to reduce innocent Afghan citizens to the level of collateral damage while the innocent American citizens that died in the September 11th attack are cause enough murder to murder an even greater number of Afghan citizens. Well, I believe her answer would be, and I, again, don't want to put words in her mouth, but I believe she would say that she did not support the war on Afghanistan, although uh, she seemed to object to anybody who objected to the war on Afghanistan. And if we had another three hours, I'd invite her back to try to clarify that. Uh, Nick writes to say, your guest said that she wanted the U.S. military to use surgical operations to remove, possibly kill, the people responsible for the 9-11 attacks. That's what the government, exactly what the government said they were going to do. But as you pointed out, they seem to have done it poorly. And uh, Jared writes also to say, if Ilana would like to see invading foreigners, her words, not mine, kept out of the country, please ask her, what year did your ancestors invade the USA? Well, I'd have to say on her behalf that she seemed not to be opposing all immigration, but she wants a particular kind of immigration that is culturally compatible with what she believes the American ideals are. And I must say that we have not been a homogenous country ever. There were enormous arguments at the time of the revolution between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. And after uh, Washington was elected the first president, there became enormous arguments between the Federalists and the Democrats. And these were not just party differences like the Republicans and Democrats have, where it's over who can best manage big government, but rather questions of exactly what the government should be and what the government should be involved in. And while the politicians on both sides were hypocrites sometimes, the fact is that it's hard to read what they said and did and not gain the impression that they really believed what they were saying. It wasn't just for to gain a political uh, one-upmanship on the other party, which is what you get from the Republicans and Democrats today. Hamilton and Jefferson had real differences about a national bank, about uh, a federal power, about uh, corporate welfare, about things of this sort. And those arguments continued throughout the 19th century. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans, uh, well, first the Whigs and then the Republicans, had real ideological differences, unlike the Democrats and Republicans today. Paul writes to say, as you know, the American government has made no secret of its intentions to declare an unprovoked invasion of Iraq, which will inevitably result in the deaths of many thousands of innocent civilians. 
By Ms. Mercer's, Mercer's logic, I always get hung up when I try to use the word Ms. It just does not come off my tongue easily. By Ms. Mercer's logic, have we all, as Americans, forfeited our right to life for conspiring to kill innocent people? And, Paul, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that we are responsible uh, for what the government does if we choose to make the Afghan people and the Iraqi people responsible for what Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden or Omar the tent maker do. And I agree with you. Uh, libertarians, if anything, believe in individual responsibility, not collective responsibility. And finally, Avis in Minneapolis says, I'd like to thank you for bringing a high level of civility to your talk radio program. Though I'm no libertarian, I often enjoy reflecting on your thoughtful and respectful perspective on things. I agree with some, but not all, of your views. However, I always enjoy listening to you because you are much more polite than Rush Limbaugh, Michael Savage, or Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly is not polite? Thank you in particular for never allowing situations where people shout each other down or talk over each other. Well, it's a lot different when I'm the host as to when I'm the guest on somebody's show, and I really have no control over it. Let's go back to Indianapolis now, uh, because Guy, whom we talked with earlier, uh, also wanted to talk about something other than the war on terrorism. Guy, are you still with us? I'm still here, Harry. Okay, thank you for your call, and uh, what, where are we now? Uh, we're going to talk about the, the future of the party, if you don't mind. The future of the Libertarian Party? That's correct, the Libertarian Party. You uh -huh. say it better than I do. Hey, uh, I, I got a little um, niche here in Indianapolis with our stance on the war on drugs. And it's not so much the platform. I think we should keep, keep the platform the same. But our message should be very much different. We need to quit endorsing organizations like Normal and people who, who believe that medical marijuana is okay. Even though, deep down in my heart, I believe that medical marijuana is okay. As Marion County, which is Indianapolis, as, as the outreach coordinator here, I have learned that we are wasting our time trying to change the mindset of voters that marijuana is okay. They don't care about glaucoma victims. They don't care about the casual user. They don't use marijuana. They don't want their kids to use marijuana. So therefore, uh, approaching this issue is a, is a non-issue. Uh, non I mean, and, and the other thing is that I've gone to concerts here in town at Verizon Wireless Music Center, and I've tried to get votes from the marijuana users that go to these concerts for libertarianism. And the only uh, conclusion I've come to is that pot smokers don't vote. We need to <laughs> seriously. They're they too busy. Vote. You can you can you can lead a pot smoker to libertarianism, but you can't get him off the couch. It's basically what I'm saying. And what we need to do is change our outreach to not necessarily pro marijuana, but anti drug war. We need to make that our focal point. And I see in the party, inside the party, the David Nolans, those types, coming out for the right of the drug user. That the drug user is a human being and he has the right to do to his body anything he wants to. As a libertarian, I believe in that. But as an outreach coordinator, I believe that we are much better off approaching the drug war more as saying, hey, the drug war hurts the minority community because of the black, black market. It hurts our inner cities. It hurts our families. It, it leaves the, uh, the average guy vulnerable to being knocked off by a crack addict. Okay. I think we got the picture. Uh, here's what I have to say on it, and then uh, this will probably take us right up to the break, but uh, if you'd like to hang on and, and come back uh, with some further remarks after that, that'll be fine. I agree with you that we have to be very careful about imposing on people our rights and or the rights of drug users or the rights of this, the rights of that. I have a right to defend myself. I have a right to this. Nobody cares about your rights. I agree with that. All they care about is their own lives and, to a lesser extent, some issues that they think will affect the future of the country, and we need to personalize those things to what is important to them. That doesn't mean compromising our principles. It doesn't mean watering down our positions. Just as you have pointed out, you're not for soft peddling the drug war. You're, in fact, uh, in favor of, of uh, being more adamant about the drug war. Uh, but uh, I agree with you that it doesn't do any good to talk about anybody's rights except the person who has already decided that his rights have been violated, in which case you want to talk to him about, well, how are we going to get your rights back? And uh, as far as... Um, Pot smokers not voting, uh, that's a good point, but I think that over a period of time it's the same as with all the other people that are labeled apathetic. They will only see the point in voting when they believe that there is a reward so great that it's worth overcoming whatever resistance to voting they had before. Even if they don't believe that the effort can succeed, if they think this is going to make an enormous difference in their lives, if it just somehow could succeed on that one in ten chance, then uh, it's worth doing. It's like saying to somebody, I think we ought to have a 10% reduction in income tax instead of a 5%. Well, that's not going to get anybody who doesn't vote to come out and vote. But talk about never paying income or Social Security taxes again, and suddenly that person's eyes light up, even if he doesn't believe you can bring it about. And this all brings us back again to 
the point that we have to have a radical agenda, first of all, because it's right, and if we start advocating things that we don't believe are right, then we've compromised ourselves just like the Republicans and Democrats do. But secondly, because only a radical agenda will bring enormous benefits to people and cause them cause the non-voters to start voting and cause the Republican and Democratic voters to seriously consider abandoning their parties, even if they believe their parties are the only ones that have a chance to win. And so I think that it is very, very important to go the whole distance. I'm, I have conflicting emotions about the medical marijuana issue. I think it is a good wedge, wedge issue, but I am always uh, wary of interim steps as being uh, of any utilitarian value whatsoever. One quick email from Eric saying, if we start looking at Muslim appearance only, we can be assured that the next act will be by someone who is wearing blue contact lenses and blonde dyed hair. Uh, good point, Eric. The government always locks the barn door after the horse is stolen. Forgive that. That's just a new metaphor I made up. Uh, but I also should point out that Alana Mercer would probably say that it's not a question of what they look like, it's where they come from, and that immigration should be limited to particular parts of the country. also want to point out that um, David wrote in, and he gave me a website uh, at Cato, where there is uh, much more on that Defense Science Board, Defense Science Board report that I mentioned earlier. So when the show is over, I'll put that on my radio links page on the website. My website is harrybrown.org, and right at the top of the homepage is a radio link, and if you go to that radio page, you will find down in the right-hand menu a radio links uh, connection, and you go there and you will see uh, websites uh, that have been mentioned on the show and so on, and you'll find that Cato report there where you can uh, read more about that. And also, John Stossel this week will have a full hour Tuesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern for a show on the drug war. And I think it's one of his Give Me a Break uh, series. And there is a lengthy description of it, apparently on the ABC site, uh, at least according to uh, somebody that wrote in whose name I don't have here. In any event, I will put the link to the ABC site on that Radio Links page so you can go and get that. It looks like this is going to be a very good report on the drug war. So I thank John Stossel for that. And, Guy, I thank you for hanging on. We just have a couple of minutes left. Is there anything you want to say in addition to uh, what we've discussed about medical marijuana and the drug war? Very quickly, in general, I'd like to say that in the uh, delegations in the, at the Libertarian National Convention, I was blessed with having a short drive to the convention. I endorse Eli Israel. And um, all three candidates had a very strong position for libertarianism, but more than anything, Mr. Israel conducted himself as a professional libertarian. He con conducted himself as a person who could lead the party by um, image, uh, a person who people could take seriously. And the other two candidates couldn't. Uh, Mr. Neal, in his uh, uh, comments on C-SPAN the day after he won the, uh, won the election, um, backed my position up by stating that Ed Thompson was perhaps from Minnesota, but he wasn't sure. Um, this is not something that we need for the party. We need professionalism. We need people who can speak clearly, who dress nicely, who the general public can take seriously. And Mr. Israel, um, he he showed that more than any other candidate. Well, I agree with you. As you know, I endorsed him. I gave the nominating speech for him, and I have a great deal of respect for Eli Israel. And he has done so much for the party as the chairman of the Massachusetts Libertarian Party. And I would have liked to see him bring that expertise to the National Party more than anything else. My chief concern was the growth of the party. This party was the fastest-growing political party in America, and now it is in competition with the Reform Party for being the fastest shrinking party in America, and it's been in that condition for about the last three years, and I'd like to see that turned around. And only Eli was concerned about that. He was the only one who was emphasizing the growth of the party as the method by which we would have the fundraising facilities, the connections, the talent, the skills, all of the things that are necessary uh, to do all the things that people, that libertarians want us to do. All these things rely on a much bigger membership in the party itself and only Eli seemed to realize that guy I'm sorry to cut you off but that's it for tonight and we look forward to doing this again next week we being me the royal we and I sure do thank you for being with us tonight and I look forward to talking with you next Sunday evening good night this is Harry Brown